Hello and welcome back to the Ever Changing World podcast. I'm your host, Ava Zanetti, and today's podcast is going to be more of a chill one. So, before I get obviously into the content, I want to just do a little brief overview of how the week's been. I also really want to discuss why I chose today's topic because it actually was really difficult for me this week to figure out a topic. I had so many in mind and it it wasn't even that. It really was the ones that I had in mind I was actually kind of afraid to talk about. So, of course, if you are keeping up with any sort of news outlet at all, um, obviously I'm recording this uh, February 21st. Um... Uh, 2022 so if you're listening to this at any time in the future um really what's going on right now is there's kind of there's a conflict right now in the ukraine and um i i was really wanting to talk about the russia ukraine war and the potential with nato and everything that's going on right now and i kind of stopped myself because i really wanted to talk about the political side of it i really wanted to get into that But I basically stopped myself since I was like, I don't want to talk about politics just yet. Not saying I won't in the future, but I'm just saying right now, especially with my age and how young I am. And, you know, I I don't want to like put those types of viewpoints out on this type of platform. I feel like it's better to kind of just leave the politics to the politicians and, um allow myself to talk about something a little bit less uh, immediate as well, since it is a really immediate thing right now. There's a huge conference with Russia today and uh, Putin, and it was, you know, it's just been, it's just been kind of a mess, to say the least. So I really didn't want to talk about that, and I thought, okay, well, what am I going to talk about then? I thought, okay, another great timely topic, of course, is the Olympics. I thought this would be kind of a fun, kind of more of a chill episode. I want to get into the history of the Olympics. Um, some of the t- the two uh, events that kind of stood out to me recently. Um, of course, this is a four-man bobsled team, but from Jamaica, of course. You know, cool runnings. Don't discuss that. The huge skating controversy with Russia, and that was not intentional at all, um, but it has been with Russia. And um, I also I was also looking into a few different like controversies from before, and then also it just ended the Olympics, so kind of the rankings that happened. Um, but obviously, before I get into all of that, I just want to uh, update you guys on my week as well. A little segment that I want to add before I talk about any topic is I want to do talk about what book I'm currently reading. So I thought this would be a fun way to kind of update you guys on new things I'm learning, since I always like to just continuously learn, no matter if I'm researching a podcast topic or... Or if I'm doing something completely different, I always like to kind of just learn whatever I have. So actually, I just went to the mall the other day and I went to Indigo, and that's a Canadian bookstore if you don't know. And uh, I got two different books. I just started the first one today. I only read like 10 pages though. Um, But it's called The Pilmerage by Polo Corello. And if you have been keeping up with the podcast, you know I did a whole hour and a half episode and Really, I didn't even get all I wanted to talk about the book uh, in that episode, but I talked about the book The Alchemist. So for that whole hour and a half, I just talked about The Alchemist, um, and, I, and I, I really had to stop myself almost. I think it was probably the whole hour, and I only got through like 30 pages. It was it was a lot in the book, and honestly, um, if, I'm, if ever in the future, I'll, I'll definitely make sure I let myself talk for longer with the book episodes. Because sometimes it takes a really long time to get through, um, you know, that type of book. And the book itself you know, is only 170 pages, but it, it takes a while. So I've actually read another one of his books, the recent one, The Archer, that came out. And that was an amazing book. Highly recommend. And now I'm deciding to read The Pilmerage. Um, on the back of the thing, it said, it, you know, back cover. It said it worked kind of hand in hand with The Alchemist. So I'm assuming it's kind of similar to it. Though, again, it is kind of finding your personal legend. So, all of his books kind of hold a similar theme. So, I kind of expected that anyways. But, I just want to update you guys on that. And, I also bought another book called The Lean Startup. And, uh, this is kind of a more entrepreneurship book and the tech scene. So, I'm super interested. And, obviously, this time in my life is really looking onward and seeing career-wise what I want to do. And, um, I mean, you know, I like reading a lot, obviously, and I'd love to go into something entrepreneurship related, but I also really love science and STEM, so I'm really just kind of deciding that, and 
I really love to read nonfiction books as well, so I feel like that's kind of been helping me through this time to kind of read these books and kind of give a better overview, a better oversight of the different types of things that I want to be doing in my life, because it is definitely that time um, that it is. And if you don't know, I'm in grade 10 currently, and I just picked my grade 11 courses, so everything is kind of becoming real. Uh, in a year and a half, I'll be writing college admissions essays, even a little less than that. So it is definitely happening quick, but um, it is definitely an exciting time as well. So uh, with all that said, that is the book that I am currently reading. I also, I think I'm in the middle of it, but I'm reading um, a book called, shoot, what is it called? It's um, by Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo, I believe, and it, he he was one of the co-founders of Netflix. Oh, sorry, it's called It Will Never Work. Um, really good, actually. It was really interesting since he is he was in his 40s with uh, two or three kids and a wife uh, when he actually started Netflix, and um, the big donor, obviously, is the one who gets a little bit more credit, Reed Hastings, since obviously he um, spent a lot of money through that. I think that's, I think that's who it was. I haven't read the book in a while, though, but um, that's a really, really good book as well, and I find a lot of the entrepreneurship books I really tend to enjoy, and a uh, nonfiction in general, so those books I definitely all recommend. Um, I also really like some of the science books as well that I've read recently, so yeah, I think those are all really, really great. I highly recommend go checking those books out, and I hope you guys like this little segment. I always like to take a few of the first minutes to kind of just relax into the episode, especially today's. I really want to give a good preface, preface, however you want to say it, that uh, today's episode is going to be a bit more chill. Um, it is definitely a little bit less research than some of mine, and obviously I really just want to go into the history of the Olympics and some of the unique stories of the Olympics. I think the Olympics is such a such an interesting time of year. Happens every two years, of course, every four for summer, every four for winter, and then obviously it's every two years you get the Olympics. And these athletes are insane, right? They work their whole lives up to this moment, and usually a lot of these athletes are very, very young. I mean, we see teenagers, like people my age, and I'm 15 for reference, like people my age doing the craziest things, doing the craziest jumps, doing the craziest moves. And it really is such a big thing, and I think it's such a big thing for the world, and it's something that really connects us in a way, and has connected us through time. It's, it's, been, it's really timeless as well. And I think it is really inspiring as well, especially all the small countries with maybe they only had one person. And you have to remember, too, Winter Olympics is very unique, and that's the one happening right now or just ended. Um, because the Winter Olympics, a lot of places don't have snow, right? The whole one is the Cool Runnings, Jamaican bobsled team. They don't have snow, right? And obviously I'll get into that. But, uh, a lot of places in the world don't get snow or heavy snow like Canada, where I am, or Sweden, right? Or Switzerland. That's why these places are, or Russia, right? That's why these places are so good at the Olympics winter, because they have the snow, they have the weather for it. And then the summer, of course, I think a lot, a lot of teams play. I think almost all of them, all the countries, since obviously that is kind of an easier time to play because, you know, everyone pretty much gets good weather or the sports that you play in the summer. I mean, they could be indoor as well if you're practicing, if it the weather was really bad, but, you know, no one's kind of living in that way. So I think that's also really unique about the Olympics. And it's also one thing, it's not like the NFL where only the America America is playing. It's not like, I mean, FIFA, yeah, a lot of countries play, but this is something where almost every single country watches, and they watch, you know, and, and, and every country hosts it at some time, or most countries do, depending on, you know, money, obviously. And it's, it's such a big deal in the world. And I think that is, you know, such an interesting, interesting thing that we do. Such an interesting tradition. And uh, why don't we just get into the history then? Because I'm kind of just leading to that, of course. Um, one second here. I'm just going to get through to my sources. Okay. So, of course, if you know anything about the Olympics, it was originated from Greece, ancient Greece specifically. 
And um, here I'm reading a history article, and you can check that out in the bio. Um, it was created as many as 3,000 years ago, which is absolutely insane to me. Of course, we also know Greece was was quite quite the country, especially ancient Greece. Um, they had so many mathematical, philosophical thinkers that thought way, 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 way ahead of their time. They also had the Olympics. They created the marathon. And they did they did all of these insane things in so many different disciplines. I think ancient Greece is, is so insane to think that they were thinking like this at the time. And it almost took the rest of the world to kind of catch up to them at some point. So, obviously, it's no surprise that they were the ones who created the Olympics. The whole thing is, is that, yeah, it was created 3,000 years ago, but of course we know ancient Greece kind of fell and uh, it was revived, though, in the late 19th century, so late 1800s, and has become, you know, the world's, you know, preempted sporting competition. So this information here is that from 8th century BC to the 4th century AD, so before Christ, you know, and then um, the games were held every four years in Olympia. So that's why it's named the Olympics, of course, because of the place it was held in, which is Olympia. And um, it was held every four years, which is another big thing. And it was in honor of the god Zeus. So the whole thing behind this is, of course, we know the Greeks were very, very brilliant people. And they truly believed in their gods. And they had um, many gods. And we know it, it's really famous. I mean, if you read the Percy Jackson series books, if you've read anything really, even when you're, I, when I was younger, I was super interested actually in learning about this stuff in ancient Greece and the gods and mytho mythology is a huge one. So, if you really think about it, um, Greece has been such a predominant force in a lot of our culture today. And they really, really, really looked up to their gods or maybe feared their gods is probably a better word. So, Zeus, obviously, is the big one. Wrath, you know, lightning and all of that. And um, another main point that's highlighted here is that the first Olympics took place in 1896 in Athens. So this is, like, the one with everybody. And um, and it featured 280 participants from 12 nations competing in 43 events. So obviously it started off very, very small. Now we have a lot. Actually, I really do want to look up how many countries participated in this year's Winter Olympics um, because I think that's really important in this year's winter olympics okay because i think that's like super important to kind of get an idea so let me see a list i don't know why they aren't giving me a number okay so uh this is a kind of a stark comparison um so how many countries were in the 2022 winter olympics there are 84 countries participating in the 2022 winter olympics so, individual National Olympic Committees, or NOCs, help organize each country's proposal for recognition, etc., etc. And there are actually a total of 206 of these. Um, so, I think, the, I think the Summer Games had a lot more Summer... Let me look this up. Summer Olympic Games. Okay, sorry about my typing there. Um, let me see... How many countries participate? It says 206, but I'm not really sure. So it says, okay, yeah. So I believe in 2020, more than 200 countries participated in summer. So a lot more participated in summer, obviously, than winter. But still, even when we just look at the winter, which obviously was just held, um, it is a crazy amount, a crazy jump from 12 nations, which is absolutely nothing. And 43 events is still quite, quite small compared to what we have today. We have so many random events and scary ones, too. Have you ever seen the skeleton one where people go down headfirst on ice and it's super high speeds? is absolutely insane. So, since 1994, which is actually really recent, if we want to think about it, not in perspective to our lives, but think about it just in perspective, in general, it is very recent. The Summer and the Olympic Winter Games have been held separately. separately. So, before, they weren't even separate. They would have these games kind of combined, so they just kind of separated these two now, which 
I think it makes a lot more sense. And then, of course, now they were held from February 4th to February 20th in Beijing, China. So, let me... Oh, I don't think this website likes me. This website is not cooperating right now. My computer's not cooperating. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So, um, okay, so here it's the first actual written records of the Olympics. This is obviously in ancient Greece. Date back to 776 BC, so before Christ. So, (laughs) the history here is when a cook named Corbus one, so it's C O R O E B U S. Corbus. I'm sure it's pronounced a lot differently than I'm saying it. Butchering it. So he won. There was only one event, and it was a 192 meter foot race called the Stade. So this was actually the origin of the modern war, the stadium. And this was to become the wor- uh, first Olympic cha- champion. However, it is generally believed that the games have been going on for many years by that time. So, we really didn't have any record before that time. That was the first one we had a record of. But it seemed that this had been going on for a very long time. So, the legend was that it ha- has it that Hercules, which um, it, what, it is the god of the underworld, uh, son of Zeus, and the mortal woman Alchemin, so not Zeus, but his son, founded the games. So, that's kind of the tradition behind it. They believe that's who founded the games. Which, by the end of the 6th century BC, had become the most famous of all Greek sporting festivals. So this was huge, man. Like, this was really, really big. People cared about the Olympics. And obviously, they still do today. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, really thinking that we had this 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 thing where we thought, you know, Zeus, Zeus's son and Hercules and these people created this event. And you know what? Maybe they did. But, you know, we believed, you know, these gods created this event. And then we've kept this going on for thousands of years. I think that is absolutely insane. So actually, the ancient Olympics were held every four years between August 6th and September 19th. So this was honoring Zeus. So obviously they were named after Olympia, a sacred site. Um, And it was the influence of this was so great uh, that Asian historians began to measure time by four-year increments in between Olympic Games, which were no were known as Olympiads. So the Greeks literally created this thing that was so iconic, so huge, that they quite literally measured time in four-year increments using the word, which is crazy. Another thing, a little did-you-know fact from this website, is that the 1896 Games featured the first Olympic marathon, which followed the 25-mile route run by a Greek soldier, who brought news of victory over the Persians from Marathon to Athens in 490 BC. Fittingly, Greek Siphon Lewis won the first gold medal in the event. In 1924, the distance would be standardized to 26 miles and 385 yards, which I think is very interesting. They named it after this guy who was like, hey guys, we won victory, which I think makes sense, obviously. They made this, but it is a crazy distance that he ran. Um, I personally ran a marathon, and it was, and I wasn't even that fast. I ran in, like, five hours, five, probably a little even more than that. It was, it was a crazy, crazy run. Took a lot of training, and this guy, to just kind of, I mean, he was a soldier, and who knows how fit people were back then, but to kind of run and bring victory and run that far is insane, and, um, I think it's really interesting, the origin of these things. And I think that's why I really like learning about history and just these random things. And I think hopefully you gain a little bit of value from that. But obviously they named Marathon after where he came from, where he heard the victory of the Romans, which was from Marathon to Athens. And then they made it 26. I don't know why they made it 26 miles, but, um, sorry, 1924, they made it to 26 miles. Maybe they thought it was just a cleaner number. I'm not too sure why, but I mean, they waited a quite, quite like 30 years do that well not 30 not 30 the the the, the 19 1896 games featured the uh marathon i don't know if the olympics still feature a marathon actually that's a really great question i know we have big things like the new york marathon um and all of that actually i'm going to look that up because i think that would be really interesting if they kept it um let's see does the olympics carry the marathon i don't think they do so the marathon at the summer olympics is the only road running event held at the multi-sport event oh okay so they kept it i believe 
Yeah, they did keep it. Okay, well, that makes sense. <laughs> and this is really historic. So, yeah, they still have kept it. And I guess they just switched it to 26 miles. I don't know why. That would be a really interesting thing to look up. Anyway, so after 13 Olympiads, so if we do the math here, and I'm totally not looking at my calculator to do the math here, um, we would have... One second. I'm totally... I'm just counting in my head, guys. I'm just such... A great mathematician where I'm doing this in my head. Um, not my phone bugging out. 52 years. After 52 years, two more races joined the state at the Olympic events. The Dulios, so this was, this is kind of like the 400 meter race comparable to, and the Dulikos, okay, I am horrible at pronunciation, which is a longer race, and it's kind of the 1.5 kilometer or 5 kilometer event. Or, and also the pentathlon, which was five events. So, foot race, a long jump, discus, and javelin throws, and a wrestling match. That's an interesting mix of things. Um, a foot race makes sense. A long jump is kind of weird. I don't know what a discus is. Javelin throws and a wrestling match is such a weird mix of things. Be very disciplined in a lot. But that was introduced in 706 BC. Boxing in... 688 BC in chariot racing, which I'm sure you've seen those photos online of Greek people chariot racing. I think that's a really cool event. They should bring that back. Uh, which is 680 BC. And in 640 BC, the pentathlon. So this is a combination of boxing and wrestling with basically no rules, which really weird. Um, and obviously this was kind of just for males at first, and there was no women events. And married women were prohibited from attending the competition. Very interesting. So, obviously, it stopped for a while. So, why did it stop? Oh, that's a great question. So, after the Roman Empire conquered Greece, <laughs> obviously, in the mid-2nd century BC, the games continued, but their standards and qualities de quality declined. So, Rome, Rome kept it, but they kind of declined. And a big example here was from AD 67. So, the descendant royal emperor Nero uh, entered an Olympic chariot race, only to disgrace himself by declaring the winner event, de sorry, declaring himself the winner of the event, even after he fell off his chariot during the event. In AD 393, Emperor Theodosius, uh, one, a Christian, called for a ban on all pagan festivals, and in the Olympic tradition, after nearly 12 centuries, that is really sad that this guy kind of just said, you know what, screw you, I'm going to end this crazy cool event because, you know what, I don't like it. I don't like the Olympics. Well, you know what, man, he lost that battle because we're still doing the Olympics in 2022, which I think is beautiful. But I think, the, I think the Olympics decline is really interesting. Obviously, the decline was because of the Roman Empire, but they did keep it, which I did not know. So they kept it for a while, and then they would arise again. So obviously, after 1,500 years, the games would arise again, largely thanks to the efforts of... We can thank him, Baron Pire de Coubrion. Okay, let me pronounce that again. <laughs> Baron Pire de Coubrion. Ooh, that was pretty good. Um, when she was born in 1863 to, and lived till 1937. And it was, of course, from France. And he dedicated to the promotion of physical education. So he was really inspired of creating the idea of a new Olympic modern games after visiting ancient Olympic sites. So he kind of saw this great inspiration. He was like, you know what? We're lazy. We need to get fit again, guys. Let's do this thing. So in November 1892, at a meeting of the Union des Sports Athletiques in Paris, uh, Coubrion proposed the idea of reviving the Olympics as an international athletic competition held every four years. Two years later, he got approval he needed to found the International Olympic Committee, which we still use today, which would become the governing body of modern Olympics. So, of course, through the years, you know, the first modern Olympics held were in Athens, Greece, in 1896. So, they held it back in Athens, which is great, obviously, because that's kind of where it originated from. And in the opening ceremony, King Julius and a one and a crowd of sixty thousand spectators, which actually is, is quite a big amount, welcomed two hundred and eighty participants from twelve nations. Again, a very small amount of people, which obviously were all male. Again, who would compete in forty three events, so obviously track, gymnastics, swimming, wrestling, kind of the basics, shooting and fencing as well, weightlifting. And then all the subsequent Olympiads have been numbered even when no games take place. As in 1916 during World War I, and 1940 and 1944 during World War II. So, 
The five interlocking color rings represents the continents of North and South America, so that's as one, Asia, Africa, Europe, and Australia. The Olympic flag featuring a symbol in a white background flew for the first time in 1920, so the one that we've seen, the iconic one from 100 years ago, that has been there. And then this took off internationally as a sporting event in 1924, so they were held in Paris, one V111. And some 3,000 athletes, so obviously a lot more than more than 100 women among them. So they, they kept the women, they brought them along uh, from 44 nations competed that year. And for the first time, the Games featured a closing ceremony. And then the Winter Olympics also debuted. So, actually, this is another interesting fact. 2004, the Summer Olympics returned to Athens for the first time in more than a century. Which is super interesting. That was a record of 201 countries competing. And in a gesture that joined both ancient and modern Olympic traditions, the shot put competition that year was at the site of the classical games in Olympia. I think that is really beautiful. I mean, b before I get into kind of the modern stuff, I think that um, that the, the tradition that we've kept with the Olympics is truly a beautiful thing. We obviously have to thank the Frenchmen for bringing back to bring back the modern olympics and i think that it, it's a great tradition it really is it really encourages some healthy competition between countries and it's really recognized worldwide i mean you hear kids all over the world saying they want to go to the olympics and i think that's super cool it's a super cool goal uh olympians are obviously super super talented super athletic and work their whole lives for this stuff and I think the history of it is super important. Um, I know I've always been super fascinated with ancient Greek culture, ancient Greek rituals. I've always been fascinated about um, kind of how, how the past was, especially in Greece. I always found Greece to be super, super cool. Um, just, just because it's... Um, such an interesting place, especially, obviously, with their, uh, um, what was I gonna say? With the, the, the gods that they have, and I think that's interesting as well, how they mentioned that that's where it originated from. It's all super cool, all super amazing, and I think that is super, super, super cool. So, um, let me see. What do I want to talk about next? I don't think there's really anything else I can kind of give an idea about, maybe about the past. Actually, there's some interesting things here. So, obviously, we know this was kind of in honor of Zeus, the father of Greek gods and goddesses. And um, the Greeks that came to the sanctuary of Zeus and Olympia shared the same religious beliefs and all that. And obviously, this was named after Mount Olympus. Um, let me see. So, it began. Let me see. I think a lot of this information we've already looked at. Just looking at this website. Um, let me see. So, they thought it, it might be as early as the 10th or 9th century BC, which is absolutely insane. Um, let me see. So, the marathon was not an event that happened a lot later. And, um, which we know why. We know what that was. Okay, so this is a little fact here, I guess. If you want to learn about a fact about nudity at the games. So, we've heard stories about this at the ancient Olympic Games. So, one of the stories states that a runner from Mingra, or a priest, or, 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 or a hippos, is basically what it is, who, in 720 BC, was first run naked in the race... Um, another tradition was that the Spartans who introduced nudity in 8th century, so it wasn't really clear. It, but it just seems like it was, nudity was common. I mean, I guess in that time, like, it was kind of a common thing. Okay, the, the Olympic flame is a nice thing. So, the idea of a torture Olympic flame was first inaugurated in the 1928 Olympics in Amsterdam. So, this was not, not a really, it obviously isn't as far for us now, but this was... Quite a recent development because, um, obviously this been, I mean, this, the Olympics has been going on forever. So this was quite recent in a sense. 
And um, they were known, however, torch relays and other ancient Greek athletic festivals. So they kind of took the idea from past athletic festivals and um, they said, okay, um, you know, we are going to use this for the Olympics instead. So, I mean, I think that's pretty interesting. But, again, it really originates from Greece. I think that's really really cool okay oh (laughs) i was just looking at the news of the olympics and there's some really interesting this is a huge i looked up olympic news and this one just keeps popping up i i don't even know how to comment on that one so i'm gonna go into the four-man bobsled team um so of course if i mean obviously watch cool runnings it's an amazing movie but long story short Jamaica never had a bobsled team because obviously they are a warm climate country. And then they had a bobsled team. They came last. But the whole story was quite amazing. I'm sure everyone has watched Cool Runnings, but if you haven't, go watch it. It's a great, inspiring story, and it's obviously an amazing team. But there had, since that story, so I believe that was in 1980 or 70-something. Um, let, me, let me check that. I'm so sorry if you can hear my dog crying at the door. She is quite annoying so when did it take place because i want to make sure i get this right so it was 1987 so no no jamaican sprinter cool running no what year is it based on 1988 so um the whole thing was in the 2022 winter olympics it was their first time since 1988 having a four-man bobsled team so they had two men bobsled teams like within that time so they were like doing the bobsled event but they had it since 1988 which is a very long time from now from since then um in almost 40 years they hadn't had a four-man bobsled team though sadly i have to break the news to everybody they came in last though obviously who cares because it's all about the principle they live in jamaica for god's sake um yeah so it was it was my term after return is the olympic stage after qualifying for their first four men bobsled event in 24 years so i think that that alone is inspiring right who cares if you came in last you made it to the olympics man and i think that's what i really want to get across with the olympics in general i think it's just such an amazing thing that we do as a nation as a not a nation but as a union as the world and I think that even if you just make it to the Olympics, even if just one person in your country makes it, it is just an amazing, amazing feat. Athletic, everything. So, they unfortunately came in last, but they are super inspiring. And obviously, the cool runnings, you know, this was a huge deal. They finally uh, qualified 2022 and uh they you know had not participated since the 1998 games four man event so sorry they didn't participate after cool runnings but that was in 1994 was the last time so 24 years which um is, is a really long time obviously and it's really quite amazing that they were able to uh do this and able to really really make their country proud and i and i i know i think everybody who's ever watched cool runnings or know anything about the bobsled team we're obviously all cheering them on wanted them to win but you know what it's not always about winning it's also you know about the participation it's about really kind of bringing your team your country some pride even if you just get to go there so next i want to talk about the huge skating controversy i'm sure you heard about this one. I quite literally watched this while I was at school. My one computer science teacher put it on for us. And um, I kind of didn't really know what was going on until I researched this again. So if you did not know, skating, this is for the women's event, um, is quite the insane sport. Quite amazing athletes, beautiful people. They are just truly elegant, graceful, and they do amazing, cool spins on uh, knives on ice quite literally so you know if if you really boil down any olympic sport i think it is quite funny or any sport in general um if you break it down to its basics what it is but i think that's the beauty in it as well so if you didn't know we had some amazing athletes in this as as, as we usually do and we had one 15 year old so someone who's my age which is kind of crazy to me 
And uh, she is an amazing, an amazing um, figure skater. So the whole thing was there was a doping scandal. And I want to get the right article for this one because I really, truly don't think that this got the right um, uh, thing here. So if I look here, oh my gosh, there's so many images here. <laughs> so funny. Um, let me see. Sorry about this. My dog is really crying at my door right now, and I'm not appreciating that. Um, skating. I mean, if I know that, I just look skating scandal. It'll come up. Russia, because it is Russian. I believe it's a Russian. Russia. Okay, so so I'm a scandal. So the Russian figure skater Camila. Valvia, Valvia falls twice to meet uh, to Miss Podium in the women's final. So I think this was yeah she was so so the Russian figure skater Camila was in first place and was the favorite. So everyone really was her favorites, and she she fell, she literally fell under pressure, and she um so the whole scandal was a doping scandal. So they kind of um they kind of thought that she i don't know the exact details on it i really i'm really trying to find it right now and it's not popping up um this one headline is like they broke her that's what they wanted and they achieved it i'm not i i need to get the details on the doping scandal because this was kind of a big deal and um skin you know i'm just gonna look up skating doping Russia. <laughs> that literally was the first thing that popped up. So, okay, so the skater tested positive, positive for trimalazine. So, this was a drug, triamethylazine. Metalazine. Sorry, metalazine. And the drug was found in the Russian skater Camilo Villa's system. So, the 15 year old athlete tested positive in December. So, a few months before this. And it was a drug typically described to much older patients to start. Suffering from kind of heart conditions, so they allowed her to skate, um, and it was kind of the big doping scandal, and she ingested it weeks before, she's only 15, you have to remember, um, so this violation didn't come until after Valentina placed first in the first part of the individual competition, Scanner samples collected by the Russian Anti-Doping Agency on December 25th, so on Christmas. However, the World Anti-Doping Agency accelerated Swedish laboratory that analyzed the sample report didn't report its results on February 8th. So, that triggered her immediate suspension from the games, and the medal ceremony went to a the Russian team gold medals, and the team figure skating competition was delayed. She successfully appealed suspension, and the favorite was allowed to compete again on Tuesday, and then she kind of didn't win. So, her lawyer kind of said that she inadvertently ingested trimozine, also called TMZ. The medication belonged to her grandfather. She somehow became contaminated, according to the attorney. The argument swayed the three judges. I mean, okay, I really have to say, especially with really, really young kids, like, my age, right? I I just think that, um, I mean, if this was intentional, and even if it was, it's usually not the kid's fault. You can't blame her. She put out under this enormous pressure from her coaches, from, like, everyone in her life. I'm sure her parents are pretty adamant. I mean, I mean, if you look at child actors as well, right, they have this pressure as well. And I think she probably had a lot of pressure from everybody around her telling her what to do when. And she could have totally just kind of got, admitted this drug. Like, it, it, she could have accidentally took it. If it was, it, if it was intentional, it could have maybe been, she had pressure from someone to take it. I'm not exactly sure what benefit TMZ would have, and I think this article uh, explains it. So, um, it, it says, you know, it's an oral medication, so people are saying, yeah, it'd be kind of hard to do it, not realistically. So it helps, okay, so the drug helps in the metabolism of fatty acids, and by doing so, it can actually have the ability of the body to use oxygen, which can help performance, underline, underline, and help relieve those chest pains brought by blocked blood vessels. So that was like what a cardiologist said at USC. It's not recommended for younger than 18, obviously, because you should not be any of that. So, kind of the side effects, obviously, dizziness, headache, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Ew. Um, but, you know, that's what happens. In rare instances, it can lead to faster, like, heartbeats, etc., etc. Um, 
So, it was added to the World Anti-Doping Agency list in 2014, because it categorizes as a hormone and metabolic modulator, so making it legal for athletes in and out of competition. So, if you increase the blood flow of the heart, you could potentially increase the performance of the heart. So, that's kind of the big thing added about this. It's still unclear whether it's true in practice, because it yet has to be studied. So, for an elite athlete, this may not make much of a difference. So, you know, many of the drug side effects, dizziness, and loss of balance, which he said, could derail an athlete's performance. So, yes, there are positive benefits, there's a lot of positive and negative, potential negatives. So, the whole thing with the doping scandal, I mean, even the drug, like, it, it, yes, yeah, sure, it could be very beneficial to her performance, it could alleviate her heart rate, it could be very good for her, but, I mean, realistically, what they're saying is it's not. And then a lot of people were kind of saying, so sorry, my dog's still crying. Um, a lot of people were still saying, well, you know, I think a lot of pressure was put on her. And then, you know, now I think that's why she fell twice. And that's what a lot of people were saying about the end there. And they were saying, oh, I just think that's why she fell twice is because of all that um, pressure on her. Which co totally could be true. I mean, that kind of makes sense. And... Um, let me see. Yeah, so heart medication, so they still allowed her to play. So, how did she do it? Not great. Okay, yeah, so she said, um, so the o IOC, who said it would hold off metal steroids. So, okay, yeah, so this other big thing about this, it was that if she got first, second, or third, the metal ceremony could not happen, which would suck, obviously, for the other athletes. It wouldn't happen because she's kind of, was still in the middle of the doping scandal. So, in a huge upset, Valviva, who was a favorite to win gold, and this was a favorite for a very long time. I mean, I remember watching TikToks, funnily enough, and someone was saying, you know, who was the favorites for the scan for the skating competition? She said this was the all star favorite. And I really remember that. I was like, wait, she's in a doping scandal? So, she actually ended up in fourth, which obviously is. Okay, let's be real here. That's amazing, but you want a medal when you go in the Olympics, obviously, and I'm sure. Actually, two of her teammates, one, one got first, one got second. So. I mean, the Russians did amazing in this category. They are amazing athletes. But she obviously fell several times during her free skate. And she got off her ice, the coach said, you know, notably hard on her skaters. She's a teenager, you gotta remember, right? And she said, you know, the coach was kind of mad, right? Like, why'd you let it all go? Et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, everyone, you know, a lot of people were saying, how. How, you know, could the coach be that pissed off at her, right? You know, whatever. But that happens a lot as an athlete, right? They get really harsh treatment, right? So, rather than giving her comfort, chilling atmosphere in the distance, whatever. So, who ended up winning? So, the Valviva's teammates did. So, Anna... I'm not going to be able to pronounce that. So, Anna Shershkabak... Okay. Shershkabakova, 17. And Alexandra Trusova, 17, won gold and silver, respectively. And then Japan's Kuria Sakamoto, 21, won bro bronze. I actually watched all of these performances at school, quite literally. I remember second place. I remember she had red hair. Um, that was kind of a big thing that stuck out to me. She was an amazing skater. She did, I think her skating skills were amazing, but I remember looking back into it, and I, th I thought she should have won. But I remember looking back into it, and they said, yeah, she did amazing flips and these amazing, crazy things. But the thing about her, you always have to remember, is that she wasn't as technical. Like, she did amazing, but there was little things, and the little things add up. So, um, actually, she was really upset, and rightfully so. I mean, if you have this pressure from your coaches, and you heard that with the 15-year-old, right? They say, why, did, why, why won't you win gold, right? She was really sad, so she kind of threw a fit. Everyone was kind of mad at her. I understand. I mean, you work your whole life for this, and she's only 17, too, right? You know, she's not even a doll. She might not be... It's a hard thing, right? You go to the Olympics, yeah, you win second, but if your coaches are putting your head, right, that, like, second is the first loser or whatever, it's gonna hit you. So, um... Uh, you know, she's kind of mad. She's like, everyone has a gold medal, but not me. I hate skating. I hate it. She was, you know, I was like, I'll never skate again. Never. So, you know, she's just as mad. I mean, I'm sure she, um... You know... I'm sure she would. But, but, I mean, it was her teammate, too, that once. A lot of people were like, oh, you know, it was her teammate. Why should she be mad? But, you know. I kind of get it, but also, you know, it's not a great way to act. I mean, whatever. Everyone's kind of nitpicking at this point. But, you know, everyone was kind of concerned with her. 
um, you know, everyone kind of felt bad for first place. Was I get too? Because she was like, this is my teammate. Like, I don't know how I feel. Like, I, I took gold from her. But, like, you know, it's also my gold medal. Like, you know, what are we, what are we getting at here? So, you know, it's. It's, it's a weird, touchy topic, but, you know, good for, good for all the medalists. Good for everybody. So, there's, oh, so what happens now? So, the saga continues. So, the World Doping Agency is still investigating the Luna's entourage, which include kind of everybody around, uh, around her. So, you know, they said this is no way to treat a 15-year-old under such mental stress, the IOC pressure. I saw the pressure on her, it was beyond imagination of a girl of 15. I mean, I'm 15, and, like, if I got that much pressure on me, like, I'd also fall twice, right? Um, you know, you can kind of see she's under immense stress. She's a minor, and doping very rarely happens alone. There is always an entourage. That is a very important quote. Especially at her age, there's usually people around her nagging her, and who knows? It probably was someone around her. So, um, I think that's a super interesting scandal. I mean, it was, the, the whole skating thing, I just, it was so prominent in my mind. I just remembered that. So that may be going to a little bit of a funnier news. Um, I don't know if I want to do more scandals. I was going to look at, like, older scandals, um, if I mentioned that in the beginning. But I don't know if I particularly want to do that, because some of these aren't too interesting. Hmm, let me see. There's some, like, people... This was another skating one. A little different, like... I don't know why these are all, uh... Skating, so... Um... I mean, okay. I mean, in the... In... <laughs> this one popped up. Um... In the Olympics, or really in anything, I mean... It... Uh... There's always gonna be a scandal, right? And that's kind of... Okay, I think I have to talk about this one. I was going to do some more scandals, but I have to talk about this one. Um, a guy's... Okay, so a cross-country skier, and I'm not going to use the word, of course, but an Olympics cross-country skier, Finn Remy, suffered a frozen area down there, if you want to entail, you understand what that means. Um, it, it froze. So, the men's 50km mass race started at the beginning of Beijing Games, but was shortened to 30 kilometers. Was shortened to 30 kilometers. But that did little help to help Finland's Remy Lid, Lidholm, who needed a heat pack at the end of the race, to fall out, you know, the, the area. So, he spent just an hour and 60 minutes traversing the course in a howling, freezing winds, which kind of led to that area being frozen, right? For the second time, uh, in a cross-country skiing race following a similar incidence in Ruka, Finland last year, which is very interesting. Um, and, and this one's just kind of funny. I mean, you just kind of got to laugh at this one, that the guy's area got frozen. And the, I kept seeing articles while I'm about this. Like, I was on CNN, and this was the first thing that popped up, and I was like, okay, this is just kind of funny. So, um, they, so the organizer was actually worried about frost by during Saturday's race. It was delayed an hour and shortened by 20 kilometers, which is a lot. That's a very, uh, that's a huge chunk. That's like almost half of it. So, you know, they have these very thin suits, right? If you've ever looked at what these people look like, they have these thin suits. They're so tiny and thin. I mean, they're thinner than the stuff I run in in the winter. And, uh, you know, there were sure under, under layers, and there was plasters and stuff, but it's still very cold. So, you know, um, <laughs> so the pain was unbearable, and I could, could imagine. Um, I, I just think that's really funny. It was really funny. <laughs> so, maybe a little bit of light after some, um, you know, interesting Olympic scandals, but, uh. That's a really funny one. So to kind of end this little episode off here, it was a really fun show. When I was going to do Olympic controversies, but I mean, come on. I'm sure I could save that for another time. Maybe in two years, I'll still do Olympic controversies and talk about those Olympics. Give myself some future content for my future self. Okay, I wanted to just kind of go over the overall um, Olympic kind of overview. So let's look at the medals. I haven't looked at this actually. So let's see who who won. Who who did it? So 
I am Canadian and I am also American. So those are kind of the two countries that I vote for in a sense when we're doing this. And I'm kind of surprised if we do all sports, all medalists. Um, okay, so number one was Norway. So they had 16 gold, 8 silver, 13 bronze, 37 medals. That is insane. That is 10 more than second place, which is Germany, with 12 gold, 10 silver, and 5 bronze. They had 27. People's Republic of China had 9 gold, 4 silver, and 2 bronze, which is 15. And then the United States had 25 medals, but they had a lot of silver. So they had 8 gold, 10 silver, 7 bronze, which kind of brought them into that fourth place. Um... Let me see. Order by total. Oh, sorry. Is this... Oh, okay. So if you're ordering it by total, I don't know how this other way was ordered. Why is this so confusing? Um. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can we just see the order? Order, please. Okay. So this is the order, but I think if you... Okay, so fourth is America, and then Canada was in 11th, so they had 26 total medals. But if, you, if we order it by total, so if you really want to go total, Norway is still number one with 37. ROC, which I believe is Russia, is 32. And then Germany, 27, which is third. And then Canada, then the U.S. So, technically, Canada and the U.S. were top five if we're just looking at total, um, like, total medals that they got. But, which I think most people look at total medals that people have gotten. But the, um... The other way, I guess, that this website was showing, which is obviously the official Beijing website, it was showing it as um, the total when you weigh out. So, like, when you weigh out how many gold and silver and how, like, that technically weighs in the way they calculated it. So, technically, Canada is in 11th and the States is in 4th, but Canada came 4th in total medals and the States came 5th. So, I think everyone did amazing. I mean, obviously, these countries make sense. Like, these are in cold climates. It makes sense where they play, so I'm really not surprised. But I think everyone did great. Um, I watched a bit of the Olympics. I think it would be super interesting. You guys should watch some of it. It was super, super cool to watch. Some little, little bit of scandals, but I mean, come on, let's be honest. It always happens. And uh, I love the Olympics. I think it's just such a great, great, great um, event. I think that it brings people together and I think that it really, truly um, is super interesting as well. The history that we talked about, super interesting why it was created and how it brought people together. I think that this is just such an amazing event. And uh, I hope you guys watched it, watched some replays, watched some old replays. And uh, in two years, I'm sure I'll be talking about this again uh, when it's Summer Olympics. So, obviously, thank you guys all for listening. I hope you like this little bit more of a chill episode next week. I'm sure I'll talk about something interesting um obviously all the resources again are linked in the bio go check out the rankings if you're interested in that um keep up to date as well with um whenever i post a new episode i always post on tuesday mornings at 6 a.m but if you ever want to check that out please connect at instagram at ever.changingworld again ever.changingworld so go check out the instagram or you can go check out the Twitter, everchanging, W-O-R, everchanging, W-O-R. I haven't really been updating that. So you can also check out my personal Twitter, which is Cambridge underscore bound. Again, Cambridge underscore bound. That is probably has more updates on there. And then obviously the website, you might be listening to it there, but it is shows.acast.com slash ever-changing-world. Again, shows.acast.com slash ever-changing-world. Again, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Tune in next week. And please follow to stay updated on new weekly episodes. Thank you guys so much for listening. And have a wonderful day.